Okay, I think we are on. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us in Up From the Margins, Latinx Voices in the Archives, a roundtable on advocacy, inclusion, and empowerment. I will make my uh, welcoming remarks and introduction very short for the sake of time, as we have one more event after this roundtable, a music performance event, and we will uh, announce uh, that at the very end. Uh, there is also a different link for that if you are connecting on Zoom. First, uh, I want to thank our guests for sharing their experiences with us and our conference organizers for the hard work invested in making this possible. Our guest speakers will center the discussion on community engagement and advocacy as it relates to creating, preserving, describing, and making accessible library collections and archives by and about Latinx communities in the United States. They will also discuss ways in which unmediated voices from these communities have been historically underrepresented in these repositories and the importance of documenting social change through programs that reinforce various forms of community engagement. They will also examine the, way, the ways in which librarians and archivists have engaged with Latinx undocumented and first generation students to challenge and confront anti-immigrant language used to describe research collections and associated taxonomies. Uh, in terms of how this roundtable is organized, I will first introduce to you our three guest speakers, and uh, I will ask them uh, as a group a question that will serve as uh, a main discussion topic. We have about 40 minutes to cover this topic. Speakers may ask uh, new or follow-up questions to other speakers, and I may do so myself if I have time. So the main discussion will be more of a, an organic nature. Um, after that, we will have uh, a 15 minute Q&A with attendance via chat. So feel free to post your questions there and we will select a few. Uh, but, re but remember that um, they will be answered after, after the main discussion. So you may post your questions in English or in Spanish. So on with the introductions, our guest speakers are in alphabetical order, order uh, Sara Ponte, Chief Librarian at the CUNY Dominican Studies oh, Institute and an Associate Professor at the CUNY Libraries. She founded the Dominican Library in 1994 with donations of books and other materials by the Council of Dominican Educators. She assists scholars and students undertaking research on Dominican issues and conducts educational workshops using archival and library resources. Also joining us is Jill Barron, Librarian for Romance Languages and Latin American and Latinx and Caribbean Studies at Dartmouth College. She is the co-director of the documentary Change the Subject that chronicles the advocacy of first-generation Latinx students from Dartmouth College who challenge anti-immigrant language in the library of carpet subject headings, specifically the term illegal aliens. We also have with us Cynthia Tobat, who is an artist, activist, scholar, archivist, and oral historian who is passionate about creating interactive participatory stories documenting social change. She's an assistant professor and head of archives at Bronx Community College, where she creates socially engaged art programming and leads community-based archiving and storytelling projects. She is also a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute, where she teaches courses on social justice in Colombia and arts activism. So to open up the discussion, um, my first question will start with a quote that Sara Ponte shared with me earlier on. No research about us without us. Uh, it is actually the title of a book on another topic, but I find it very powerful and I find it that it resonates with the topic at hand. And I will share the citation of this book uh, with you here in the chat so you have that information um, after, after, the, after I pose the question. So with this quote in mind, I would like you, our guests, speakers, to reflect on your role as heritage workers and or community and library activists. How does your work in knowledge production empower communities? And how do you engage with students and community members to challenge anti-immigrant uh, language and cultural stereotypes? And I will now uh, share this long question with all of you along with two links in the chat. Please jump in. Okay. 
I loved when you said that uh, community activists and heritage workers. <laughs> and I didn't feel like that when I began thinking about the idea of creating the Dominican Library. And, and first of all, thank you so much, Patricia, for organizing this uh, conversation. And thank you to Cynthia and Jill for being part of that and Patsy for making it happen. So um, when I began the idea of the Dominican Library, it was because people came to the Institute. We have small rooms and they were looking for information about Dominicans. Dominicans uh, during that time and sometimes today were portrayed as uh, people that came from the Dominican Republic, um, were loud, <laughs> like merengue and play baseball and, and were drug dealers. So we were like, no, we need to change that mentality. And the way we did it is working, working with the community, uh, bringing information from the community, writing about the community, writing about us, researching about us. And that's why I mentioned that to you, Patricia, uh, when you begin writing about your own community and studying your own community, you are part of it more and you represent it better. And I'm not saying that uh, we don't like people from other communities to study Dominicans. We do, we love that. But at the same time, we want also Dominicans to be a voice for their own selves. I can continue, but I want to give you opportunity to <laughs> see anything on Jill. Jill, I'm okay with uh, going after you if you like. I feel like the alphabetical order thing works well. <laughs> Okay, I can go then. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here and for having us. It's really an honor. Um, and I just love being included on this panel with Sara and Cynthia. It's really, and Patricia, of course, it's really great. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a really interesting quote, and it's something I've um, been thinking about for a while. Um, I guess I could start with why I think I'm here, um, <laughs> why I was invited, which is um, that a number of years ago, I uh, was in a research consultation with a student who was uh, trying to develop a bibliography around undocumented student activism. And, um, and over the course of our consultation, she, we encountered um, the subject heading that Patricia mentioned. Um, and the student was like shocked and deeply offended um, at, that in, at that encounter. And it was a really powerful moment for me um, to realize that while I knew that that term was pejorative, it wasn't a term that I used or would want anyone around me to use. Um, it was the term that had been designated by the Library of Congress. And because of that, because of that sort of, um, I, I just didn't question it. And so it was a really powerful moment for me to reckon with this kind of like deep, you know, structural bias in our systems, in, in our practices as library workers. Um, I was relatively new to the profession. And so um, it was a pretty powerful experience to happen maybe in my second year as, as a librarian at Dartmouth. And um, the students, not because of anything I had to do with, the students really kind of galvanized around this issue and, and um, raised it and protested the use of that term in the subject heading. And they protested it within a larger campus movement to protest inequities and, and, um, and, and harm being done to marginalized or communities that have traditionally been marginalized um, at Dartmouth. And so their grievance was lodged within um, this document called the Freedom Budget. And, um, and this is, where I learned of the student protest was because it was part of this, this set of demands to the college administration. And I found it like really um, pretty exciting that the students uh, chose that venue to continue the conversation that had begun um, at my desk with this student. 
And so we, I and others um, decided to respond to the students specifically about this item and, and, and try and sort of think about ways through that. So that was really the beginning of a movement that has taken hold in the library profession and that has gotten attention um, really on a national basis. And um, so the film that I made with uh, three other people, we were a film team of four, um, as Patricia said, chronicles this movement and all the sort of twists and turns in ways that it became um, very strongly politicized in the media and even on the floor of Congress. So, um, so it was a communal movement from the beginning that was really shared by, um, led by students. And these are um, a student group uh, that had just newly formed at Dartmouth um, that was concerned with uh, advocacy around undocumented um, issue, immigrant issues and but that librarians kind of joined in because it was through our processes and mechanisms that we wanted to try and achieve change. Um, and so the filmmaking exercise was sort of or approached in that same spirit where I didn't feel like I could, I knew there was a really good story there and that I wanted to use film to tell but I didn't trust myself <laughs> on my own to tell it. I, I wanted to involve others um, in that process. And it, it really, to me, was in the same spirit of the original movement that brought us all together. So um, Oscar, Melissa, Sawyer, and I made the film together. And, um, um, and, and I'm glad we did, I think. And so getting back to this, this quote, you no know, research about us, without us, um, you know, it's, it's, it's challenge. I, I don't know, I, I still feel like <laughs> a, a deep sense of complexity about um, the filmmaking process, about the choices we made um, and other things. And there, there's, a, there's a pair of scholars that have written a lot together, Eve Tuck and um, I think it's Wayne Yang who have really addressed um, some of the ways in which the sort of knowledge project that happens within universities is rooted in settler colonialism and like how do we extricate ourselves from that? Is it even possible? And so there are ways in which I, I kind of grapple with my role in this project um, to this day um, that, that hasn't changed, but, um, but it did feel like an important story to tell and to tell with the folks that, you know, were part of this. And um, thank you everyone for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Patricia, Sara, Jill, Patsy, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be able to uh, share with you today a little bit about the work that we're doing at the archives at Bronx Community College. Uh, when I started off uh, with this work, uh, I got my start before even cultural heritage as a community activist who sort of discovered this vibrant path to enhance my activism through storytelling work because I view archival work as storytelling work and I prim primarily work on documenting stories of social justice and activism so that it's in this sense that I view the projects that I work on at the archives as uh, moments to amplify stories of community care and power which is inherent in our very name because we're a community college. And so even though I was hired primarily to process this legacy collection around a monument that centers a lot of white greatness, uh, the Hall of Fame for Great Americans is predominantly white centered. Uh, I was very in tune with just seeing uh, about developing collections that reflected the student body and the students that we primarily serve. And it's a primarily like his, Hispanic serving institution, Latinx centered institution. So for me, it was very important to develop collections that centered the community. And for folks who aren't aware about our campus at Bronx Community College, we were formerly the NYU satellite campus. Uh, and then in 1973, the property got sold to the dormitory authority of CUNY. And then uh, Bronx Community College sort of inherited this strange space of privilege 
which had not been designed with the intention of the student body that it currently serves. So it's just sort of like a little micro history lesson for folks who aren't, who aren't aware about the history of the campus. So I sort of view myself in that role as a memory worker who focuses on counter storytelling, uh, which incorporates a more dynamic view of history making by opening up a space that validates uh, narratives that have been marginalized uh, from mainstream uh, accounts of history and uh, spotlight these like underrepresented stories. And primarily uh, I do this through a lot of oral history work, which closely aligns with counter storytelling in that it's amplifying and including marginalized voices on uh, the narrator's own terms. Uh, I use a community-based inclusive approach to these projects that uh, I get involved with to develop these collections for the archives. So for me, it's uh, very uh, essential to not only it be a mechanism by which I'm voicing what should be centered and amplified, but by standing back and listening to the community to uh, convey to me what they feel needs to be amplified. And because this is a community college serving the students, uh, it was very important for me to incorporate many of the first sort of collections that we've been working on developing here to center the students, the faculty, and the staff within the campus. Uh, and we are also work on a lot of projects that also amplify the stories of our neighborhood and our neighborhood residents. So there's a lot of that back and forth between within the institution, outside of the institution, because I don't believe that a community college operates in, in a silo. It's in, essential to maintain those lines of community engagement and keep that really active. So a lot of my other work also focuses on sort of a participatory action research approach when we're thinking about doing these sorts of collaborative uh, projects and we involve students in every step of these sort of documentary efforts. And it's really this method of research and approach when applied to documentary work and archival work, it does a really good job, I think, of engaging knowledge and expertise beyond, again, sort of like this ivory tower mentality by involving those who are intimately connected with these stories of community resilience and care and stories uh, with the shaping of the research questions, the documentary framing and the interpretations, the project design every step of the way so that it is something that is co-created in collaboration with and by for the community, which sort of echoes the opening quote and how Sarah and Jill have already responded to it. But yes, it's knowledge created by us for us. And we see this echoed especially during these really turbulent times of the pandemic, all this activism that's been happening before, during and after, you do sense this sense of like people trying to take ownership and reclaiming back their histories and how that really uh, alludes to this idea of like seeing yourself represented in the knowledge and uh, those knowledge creation mechanisms, which uh, we wanna try to bust forth and disrupt, right? Because knowledge takes all shapes and forms and even as like stewards of cultural heritage, we have to be really mindful about the way that we choose to document and how we are included. And maybe perhaps even thinking about this in a post-custodial fashion, right? Maybe our role isn't to just take collections in. Maybe our role is to advise and to be allies and partners with community uh, groups and members so that they can design and decide for themselves what this community history will be shaped like and what what what, what will it look like ultimately. Um, so one project that comes to mind, which I think sort of alludes to the main question Patricia uh, posed earlier, thinking about how do we uh, as community members uh, like challenge these anti-immigrant language, these stigmas, these stereotypes that people perceive, people from outside. And when you think about the Bronx, like already, wow, like oh, it's always been at the very bottom of the pecking order within New York City and just within the cultural like zeitgeist, uh, thinking about also the Latinx community that is primarily serviced through uh, our college, as well as uh, it's very POC centered. Uh, Raising Ourselves Up was one of the first collaborative oral history projects we participated in developing for the campus. And that was done in collaboration with Professor Nelson Reynoso, who is now currently with the social sciences department within Bronx Community College. And so uh, collaboration between him and I, and we recruited these students to do the oral histories to again, sort of raising ourselves up, oral histories of first generation college students at BCC to document the stories of first generation college students on our campus. And we believe each student's time at BCC is unique, yet all students are bound to each other by this uh, shared sense of struggle towards achieving 
that one barrier towards social and economic mobility, right? A college degree and how a four-year degree might not be auto the automatic route for many students. And so we really wanted to document those stories, but we also wanted the students to have a say in how those stories and those narratives were taking shape. So using video oral history interviews, we recruited students to uh, examine the challenges faced by uh, majority low income, working class groups of peer students from various ethnic, racial, and immigrant backgrounds. And they would identify the narrators and then we would train them in the oral history methods, methods themselves. And then they would be the ones doing the interviews. So it wouldn't be Professor Atobar, it wouldn't be Professor Reynoso, it would be student to student, peer to peer, which automatically opened the narrative structure. Uh, the students have a different a level of comfort talking about and sharing their stories. And we thought this was really essential and uh, hopefully amplifying sort of the mission of the school, which is to, you know, we're serving historically underrepresented students in higher education. And we're hoping to bust those myths and also sort of put up a mirror to administrators in colleges and community colleges thinking about these are the challenges, these are the way that they're demonstrating resilience, but listen to the challenges that they're also sharing too. And how can we as, uh, college administrators, professors, faculty, support staff do better by these students. And so we thought this would be a really good mechanism with which to highlight these issues. And within the interviews, we start to see threads along systemic racism that's sort of embedded within higher education. We start to see uh, the challenges they face, predominantly our groups of uh, Latinx and first generation students in trying to, again, uh, fight that counter deficit storytelling line about like uh, they're busting those myths within those narratives that they're able to uh, collect and hear from one another. And we also thought it was like a wonderful way of like drawing a mentoring opportunity for students as well. So it was sort of like a multifaceted way of approaching a documentary project, but we feel really proud about it. And we were able to collect these video interviews and I'm happy to put the link in the chat too for folks who wanna like uh, listen to those. And since that project, we've been involved with other methods, but we always try when we're doing these documentary efforts to really involve the students, because again, it's sort of like echoes that, that ethos, the uh, by us, for us, and it sort of keeps us honest. It, it keeps us in check to see that what we're doing and what we're documenting is, is mindful and is culturally responsive to the communities that we're hoping to serve with these stories. Um, I wanted, thank you so much. Oh, I learned so much from both of you. <laughs> but one thing that I wanted to mention is the, what you said, um, Cynthia, about students. And it comes to mind a word that since I began at the Institute, at the Dominican Institute with Professor Silvio Torres Dayan, then Dr. Ramon Hernandez, nurturing. That sense of nurturing your own. And not only on cultures, but your own student bodies, your own um, workers at, at the place that you are. And what we have been seeing is that many Dominican students are coming to the Institute as volunteers because they want to reconnect to their roots. Being born and raised in the United States. And we have examples, for example, we have Jensen Ortiz, who is now the librarian at the Institute. He has two masters and he began as a volunteer with us. So that's- He also entered with us in the Bronx. So no. he left us in. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, when Cynthia mentioned Professor Nelson Reynoso, he belonged to the Council of Dominican Educators who created the Institute. So it's a beautiful connection that we have there. And, uh, but I wanted to mention that the word nurturing and, and I was nurtured when I came to the Institute. I came as a college worst student and little by little, because of the example that I saw, because of the hard work, that's what we have now. But I wanted to mention that. That is such a great valid point. And I, I love how like, it brings it back to the community, right? And not just the communities that we serve locally, hyper-locally in our own little circles, but even this digital space, like we're creating this network, we're creating this level of nurturing, right? Amongst professionals, folks who identify alongside, ally with, or are Latinx, and we're working in cultural heritage because we feel a passion for this work. None of us is getting rich off of this work. We're not doing this to be fortune hunters. We're doing this because we love it. And it's the passion that we bring to this sort of thing. And it's 
it's beyond just also the nurturing. I think it's also to set the record straight. I feel that matters very much because especially when it comes to higher education, this idea of like the deficit storytelling and because I study uh, and I'm currently involved with the higher education program, the higher education scholarship when they talk about marginalized groups, first generation students, uh, the research uh, we're hoping to provide uh, documentary evidence, archival collections and primary source material that reflects that this type of higher education research in this regard is also grounded in the experience and knowledge of people of color, Latinx uh, students who present their counter stories to this sort of deficit story, uh, uh, storytelling narrative you hear in some of the research and thinking about how like these stories can be like theoretical or pedagogical or uh, any kind of like a uh, research tool to challenge the marginalization that we see firsthand when we're servicing students and servicing researchers who want to touch upon these topics um, and promoting more of that uh, form of social justice within the scholarship around higher education access and access to higher education and how those barriers keep people out and what we can do to dismantle those barriers, I think. And I love how it sort of aligns very well with your film and the topic of your film gel because it's like sort of like there's so many nuances to that right it's not just about what we're collecting but how we label it how we categorize it and who holds those. Who holds the power to determine that and it's like shouldn't it be us shouldn't shouldn't we have a stake in the way that we label or are categorized or why do we even need to be categorized <laughs> like this isn't representative of how I feel. I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, I mean, that's been like a really, I'm glad that you brought up um, the nurturing of like the community here too. Like, so yes, we nurture students and we, you know, but like how we nurture each other. Um, something that was really like a really surprising outcome of the film that um, I don't think any of us expected I think you know we called it we called the movie change the subject because it was like a direct <laughs> demand of the Library of Congress, like okay, change the subject, right? Um, what we didn't expect was for that to continue to not happen at the Library of Congress, but also for libraries, for people, um, heritage workers across the country and really in, in parts of the globe to commit to making local changes to that subject heading and not just that subject heading, but saying, you know what, we have other problematic subject headings and other problematic forms of description in our archives. And we're going to address that now because we see, so I don't want to say that the film is entirely responsible for that, but I think the film happened at a moment when that kind of consciousness was starting to grow across the library and archives profession, and um, and it it like it like hit a, a a note for people that oh okay yeah I need to sort of take action in my local space um, at the local level because it's not happening um, on at this national level or at this system level, um, and I think that was like a really surprising and amazing outcome in spite of like the frustration of seeing the continued um, intransigence of the Library of Congress. Um, at the same time, like I don't want us to kind of like pat ourselves on the back and be like, woo, like look what we're doing, right? Because it's like this, you know, the there there's a lot more work to do. And um, and you know, we've gotten all kinds of feedback about the film, like positive negative, you know, in between. Um, so it's it's been a really interesting experience to see that like, you know, this film does resonate for a lot of people. Um, it doesn't for others, right? Like this is looking at the subject heading as a, like an important issue for undocumented people is is not like where the energy needs to go. Yeah, this is feedback I've I've heard and and so it, like what you said, Cynthia, about like staying honest, I mean, I think that that's like really, really key in all of this work is um, like being willing and sort of open and maybe there's like a masochism in it, but being willing to hear what you don't necessarily wanna hear and, and kind of like working with that um, and evolving out of it. Um, so 
yeah, those are some some thoughts I have to that. You know, Jill, um, when you mentioned give, like patting ourselves in the back, why not? Why not? We're doing it because we want to do the same thing to others, and that's nurturing. <clears throat> and when you do it to yourself, then you're strong enough to continue passing that along. Yeah. And one thing that I, when they recently interviewed me for an article, a beautiful article about the beginning of the, the library and the institute and all that. And I, I regret that I didn't mention Salon, which mm. is an organization that we belong to, Patricia, Jill, and myself and other people in the audience. Salon is the seminar for, can you help me? Seminar for the acquisition. Acquisition of, of Latin American library materials. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an organization that awesome. we, I, when I came to Salam, I felt that I belonged. Mm. And as a, um, a, an immigrant, right, a, a librarian that was beginning to, to do work that was not supposed to be done by, by an immigrant, by a person that does not speak the language well, uh, by an Afro-Latina, you know, all of that, this uh, uh, notion. I remember going to one museum because I was looking into museum studies and library studies. And I went to a museum and the person who um, saw me, he, she said, that, that career is not going to be good for you. And also library studies, you know, like, okay, <laughs> right? And those discrimination, and we talked about anti-immigrant language and that's anti-immigrant language right there, very strongly. But I had a support system. Salam was not there yet, but I have support system at the Dominican Institute with my mentors and my family too. And they trusted me and they said, no, you can do this, study hard. And what we do is that we, if we need to do a, a master's, we do two. If you need to do three, we do three. You know, like that. all the credentials that you have to have. And that's a message for our, our students and our interns that uh, study uh, education is, is key. Education is key and it gives you a voice. It doesn't matter that it's a voice with an accent, but it's a voice. And I just wanted to mention that. Right, no, and it echoes so much of what we see in the higher education scholarship as well. When we think about like, what compared to like white students of privilege who have all the social capital already embedded, they most uh, likely have a family that have already gone to college or whatnot. And so their they're, they're so, so systems of support are sort of inherent, but for Latinx and POC communities and first gen students, those networks don't exist. And so echoing on that idea of like how as professionals, as cultural heritage workers, like that's echoed within these other more specialized fields, right? When we think about cultural heritage and who gets to um, actually uh, afford to like go through the program and like graduate school degrees and MLS degrees and certificate programs, they've always, uh, they have kept POC folks out of that. And now we see a resurgence of it. And so echoing those support systems is that we need to get those systems in place. And so the nurturing that you're talking about within our, for us, the professional development continues, but that's a mechanism of success that students need to take with them from a student to a professional is the value of networking, the value of building your communities. And that begins with like breaking it down and like making cohorts and building those uh, systems of supports for students. So like with the raising ourselves up, we created those networks of students and the students still keep in touch with one another. And with every other program that we do and documentary effort that we do, we really try to like build in that uh, behavior, build in that expectation so that students will go into, will continue their journey in higher education should they choose to do it knowing those skills and knowing that they could take that with them wherever they go so that even if the institution itself doesn't have that sense of belonging they create it for themselves with their own communities uh and it's certainly not the solution but it is part of a solution right when we think about again sort of like lowering the barriers to access so that folks can get equal access to higher education and across the board for all groups I really love that because I think both of you are talking about like sort of like an an ethic of um, an ethic of uh, engagement that is 
kind of like pushing against the sort of traditional notion, like mer the meritocracy, right? Like, oh, just work hard enough and then you'll get there and you'll get your thing and you'll get your job, right? Like the documentary project or the Dominican library, like it can't happen without a group of people fully invested in sort of sharing, um, I hate to say ownership <laughs> to make it like, you know, possession, but like sharing leadership, I guess, sharing ownership over over the activity. Um, I think that's that's really key. That's been a huge lesson for me is like knowing that, and it's like a lesson in activism too, that like no action takes place because like one person or two people, two singular, like amazing genius individuals make it happen. It's because like a lot of people are in this together and sharing. Um, so that's, that's an ethic that I continue to try and promote um, in my work with students as well, um, in spite of the way that like the curriculum may be designed, um, the expectations for success may be laid out, like you're really not gonna get there. I think in a, like it's not gonna be satisfying if you don't kind of share in it with others. You know, talking about the community, one thing that we did, and I remember when we began the conversation, we had a meeting before this, and I think it was Cynthia who mentioned the word disruption, something like that. <laughs> yes. So um, what we do when we began this um, idea of the of the library at the institute, immediately we thought about students and children and community. And one of the things that we uh, um, tried to do was the college. City College that we've learned and it has been great to us, that they allowed people from the community to come and visit us. They are not allowed to other places in the building, but we made sure that the security guard knew that the, the, our library was a community place. Of course, an higher education institution, but open to the community, an academic library open to the community always, because we began with the community. Because of the community, we exist. And Another thing that we wanted was children. Why? Especially our Afro-Latinx children. One, because we wanted to expose them to a college environment. So we invite, we invite them to come to us. Second, because we want to expose them also to archival materials, primary sources. And they can handle those materials, of course, with the appropriate, uh, with ABO and all that. Yeah. But, but they can man, uh, handle it and understand the importance of archival work. And third, for all them to come and see who is behind the archives in the library. And it has been very successful. We have, uh, and the, the beauty, beautiful thing happens, we have a very good relationship with a professor at the School of Education at City College, Professor Fraga. He's a Cuban. Um, an immigrant from Cuba, uh, but his family is from Cuba and all that, but he lives in New York. And he brings his students to us. Those students become teachers and they bring their students to us. So that's a beautiful circle that we have created. And many times also they, they bring the parents of the children. So again, you see the community come into this uh, world and sometimes they feel like it's, it's so far and they don't belong, they don't understand. And also to begin playing that in the mind of these kids that they have to go to college to get a better education. Right, no, it's like, it, it does such a great way of like sort of prepping them, right? It's like they're pre-college, right? So, Exposure to college. And I think also I'm interested in learning what those challenges are now that the college campuses have been closed during these past 18 months and they continue to shut down and reopen and shut down and reopen due to this pandemic environment. So like, it, it's interesting to me to like, uh, learn from other professionals how you've been able to bridge that lack of a physical space and uh, the, the positive takeaways and the challenges of trying to do something virtually. The way I've tried to fill that space would be by creating these documentary efforts virtually, but then also sort of relying outside of just what the campus can provide and thinking about how we could plug into what the community needs outside of the college walls too. So it's like, it's not to discourage uh, future generations from considering college as an option, but then it's also sort of, sort of like, what 
purpose are we serving as memory workers or cultural heritage workers if we're not out there in the community and the pandemic has provided no uh, doubt there's been so many documentary efforts about the pandemic right people have been documenting it at LaGuardia at different CUNY campuses like Brooklyn College uh, other uh, predominantly white institutions have done this. Columbia has an ongoing oral history project documenting the pandemic. And for us, it was so essential, at least in my circles, to focus on just like the community, the hyper-local aspects of it in regards to mutual aid, which uh, mutual aid networks for folks who aren't familiar with mutual aid and what it means is during this time, uh, during the pandemic, there's been a lot of uh, access food insecurity for many communities, particularly uh, targeting uh, uh, undocumented communities and communities who have been impacted by unemployment, uh, having to choose between paying the rent or getting your groceries, not much of a choice. So all these mutual aid networks have been surfacing in many communities and in the Bronx in particular, we wanted to document that. So we did an oral history project and this was in collaboration with Mutual Aid NYC. We got some funding with the Equity in Action Grant at the Metro Library Council and we, uh, produced this oral history documentary initiative where again, we trained students. I selected and recruited four BCC students to do this remotely over Zoom, which let me tell you was such a treat. <laughs> the students were so understanding and so patient, but yet we did it. We were able to do it and we collected some uh, interviews with mutual aid workers to document this. And the purpose is like beyond just what serves the college is just like, how can we serve the communities which with our students are residing and just our local communities because we're all going through this in some way, shape or form is this idea of like uh, food insecurity, but from the perspective, documenting that from the perspective of a mutual aid worker, which could be any one of us, it could be anyone, it could be your neighbor. Uh, it, these are not these are not paid positions. Again, it's sort of like this altruistic model, like when you know uh, the crisis would, was at its height. It wasn't the government that was stepping into ser uh, service this desperate need. It was neighbors stepping up for each other, even though they were going through the same issues. So we really thought it was important not just to document that moment. But to get, really get student feedback, like how have you seen this happen in your area in the Bronx? And then pairing them with an organizer. And then through the course of that interview to uh, build that sense of community, even though we were all isolated physically from one another, we were able to foster that nurturing and that role model, the mentoring opportunity for students. So it went beyond just the value of documenting a collection by us and for us too, but it's also serving some sort of like a higher purpose of public good and also serving as a way for uh, giving students that level of resilience because we all know, God only knows, this has been a really trying time for a lot of people. Uh, how do you even wrap your mind around it? Well, look at what these organizers are doing. And we're hoping that that sort of also echoes the, the skill set and the grit and the resilience that students are going to need um, within our programs, but then also when they go back to their communities. It's sort of like the strength building, this idea of like, we can do something uh, and it's empowering, I find. I am going to soon open up the Q&A. Uh, so I'm asking, um, actually going to send a uh, chat right now for everyone to start sending uh, questions and we will uh, hopefully get a number of them that we can just share with you, uh, our guest speakers. But um, uh, waiting for those questions, I have a, a question for you and it, it relates to something that was mentioned earlier on in a conference. I can't remember exactly who brought this up, but um, speaking of scholarship about the Latinx community here in the United States, um, uh, somebody mentioned the concept of activism versus academic activity and how they may intersect, but they don't always go together. They, they don't always have to go together, right? Um, but uh, it, I, I'm thinking this may be primarily for Cynthia and, and Sarah, although Jill will have more to, to share as well, but in turn, you, are, you, you have um, faculty status at your, at your institutions. Is the work uh, of community engagement, uh, this heritage work, this activism work, is it considered scholarship? Is it considered part of your uh, academic portfolio, for example? Is it that? Oh. <coughs> Qué buena pregunta, wow. <laughs> Directa. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, yes. Um, it happens that I am now um, applying for full professor. So yes, from the other land. So um, trying to organize my everything that they ask, I have a lot to do with community, right? But I also did my publications and I also did my, um, what's the other one? Service publication and, and student service, right? Mm. Will you make it work? You make it work. You do it in a way that, even though you cannot put everything, because as, as Cynthia said, many of the things that we do, we do it because we know that it's important and it's needed, not necessarily because it's going to help us uh, advance in our career in that sense, in the sense of, of how the hierarchy in CUNY looks like. But um, at the end of the day, you make it work. Because for example, the other day, we put together a seminar, a workshop with MoMA. And a Domin Dominican artist called, uh, called KOS and the School of Education at City College. And, but one of the things that we made sure was that it was recorded, it was uh, translated into Spanish, so now we can make it available for the community. So that counts also as a community work. So in that sense, but it's difficult, but you, nada es difícil si tú te pones en, en, en cintura, ¿no? Como decimos los dominicanos. So yes, but thank you for the question, Patricia. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I always have to like sort of preface my answer to something like that though, by prefacing that I feel that uniquely blessed because I work at a public university system like CUNY, which has such a history of advocacy. Wow. So it's not as tough of a sell for those of us working in CUNY to advocate for the service component and particularly at community colleges where they, they spotlight community service, public service leaning activity. Uh, it, it as its own little leg in that so you have your scholarship, you have your teaching, and then you have your service. Uh, and so you have to sort of balance it carefully still because then it's like sort of like a, a be, between the disciplines, it's perceived differently, like what service is. But again, sort of being blessed with working at a CUNY campus, working at a community college, uh, the, that community activist leaning work, you can make it work. Uh, it, it, and pair it off with basically your mission and just sort of like your personal statement. And again, sort of like, uh, for me, it's so deeply embedded with the work that I do. I don't find a distinction between my scholarship and my activism. They're really tightly intertwined. So for me, and because I also do a lot of this work through socially engaged art making because I identify as a socially engaged artist, for me, it's pretty, it's not that tough of a sell, but I could see that it could be challenging for folks like to make that work. And I really uh, find allies within your institution if you find it challenging, see what others have done. Um, as much as you could feel like the lone person who's doing this sort of community engagement level work and you wanna see it recognized and taken just as seriously as a published article or a book, um, see what others in your campus or in your institution are doing and, and form that community, seek those folks out and get advice or uh, outside of other institutions and see if you could trade secrets with one another and see what's worked. Uh, there are ways of making it work, uh, but yeah, I, f I find that that could probably be more challenging in institutions that don't value it. So like really do your homework, get a lay of the land and see what your institution is able to value and see if you can uh, rally folks together to get to advocate for, to get that more transparency, like to surface that up to have that valued by administrators because I wish it were more transparent, but unfortunately that's like the one thing in academia that seems to be the most opaque. <laughs> and I'd be interested to hear what other folks have done from other institutions to like sort of make that sell, but that's what I would do in that situation. It can be a whole panel, a whole conversation. That would be very interesting. Word, word. <laughs> I don't know, Jill, if you want to add anything, but I can have like a follow up to that where you, you can actually have, um, I'm sure, something to say, and it has to do with uh, a notion of disruption. We, we talked about this, you know, uh, since uh, the Latinx communities have been underrepresented in these repositories and um, 
maybe not so much in the community colleges, but but definitely in, in the other other schools that Ivy League, for example, um, have, you know, they have not been uh, traditionally been present the way they should. Um, is disruption necessary to convince people to validate this work, to, to bring these voices um, to our faculty and students and the community, the local community as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, I feel like the consciousness around these issues has definitely um, grown and improved over the past couple of years, um, given everything that's gone on in this country since 2020. Um, but I, I will tell you that, you know, when I made the movie, um, I had this idea to preserve the interview footage from the film um, and to kind of create a, I can't really quite call it an oral history collection because oral histories follow a certain methodology that we didn't necessarily use in our interviewing for the film, but the interviews for the film contained so much content that we couldn't possibly use in the film, right? So we took a 45 minute to 60 minute interview and used maybe like the two minute sort of like choice quote that fit in a certain place. But the rest of that material was really powerful. Um, and, I, and I wanted to, to, to preserve it and, and provide um, access to it. But, you know, it was a struggle to, to kind of prove the um, necessity of doing that. And, and I kind of had to fight some, some battles over it. Um, at this point, yes, we are doing it and, and it, it's, um, it, there's a happy ending, I guess, but um, it's interesting, right? And I think there was a sense in which like, well, this isn't real oral history because it wasn't conducted in a certain way. And, um, but at the end of the day, the interviews, particularly with the Dartmouth students that were part of the activist movement were very, very powerful um, uh, texts about the experience of being at Dartmouth, of being a first generation student at Dartmouth, of you know being in document in the United States. Like, you know, these these themes and these topics were um, really rich in there. At the same time, I, you know, I have my doubts about saving it. Um, I don't know. It's like, is everything meant to be saved? Um, you know, when we did these interviews, was there the, were they done with the, did the subjects have enough of a sense of like, oh, this is for forever, right? <laughs> or is this just gonna, you're gonna pull out a few quotes for the film? I don't know. I mean, you know, what like- What were I the said, release forms like? <laughs> what's that? The release forms, what did you put in for the release forms? Yeah, yeah, no, we were clear with our release forms. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like this is the quote property of Dartmouth College and, you know, um, we can do with it what we want. Um, but, uh, but still, do you know what I mean? Like for me, it brings up questions um, about, well, when we think about, uh, like an interview as property when we think about it as like it's the, now it's the property of the library. Cynthia, you mentioned um, the post custodial question before, you know, like where should this thing be? How should it live on? Um, I guess I, I sort of ask a lot of these questions and at the same time sort of try to do the best I can to and, and try and prioritize the things that I think are are most important. But um, I think the disruption, I think it's useful to also ask oneself these questions. Like that is a disruptive process too. Mm -hmm. You know, does, is this, is this the right thing to do? Um, right. right. And if you wait for the institution to make up their mind, you'll be waiting an awful long time. Right. Uh, sometimes right. like you need, you need, you need to have a little bit of that mm, to keep people in check. And sometimes within higher education, it's a very slow glacial place, very bureaucratic, you know, uh, part of right. me is like, yes, you do need that little disruption every so often. I mean, uh, move along to get along or get along to move along. Like, you, you know, you could go that route, but sometimes you do, you do need to like have that outer space to keep people in check so that, you know, people re better recognize like 
you know, we, we need a little more accountability. I'd be interested to see if you would ever consider Jill revisiting your narrators, like in getting, checking to see consent to see if they'd be interested in preserving it and seeing if that might be the beginnings of maybe perhaps preserving it if the narrators feel comfortable with it too. Have you thought about that or I'm sure you have. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We've we've been through this process for a while now and, and everybody I think is on board, but there are questions, right? There are always questions. There are sensitivities. There were certainly things we had to go back and redact because once, and I wanted to give everyone the opportunity, like this is you, this is, this is your voice. What do you want to be there? Um, so, you know, there was a lot of that sort of like high touch back and forth um, about about preserving and, and creating an archive of this, these interviews. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think it just raises a lot of questions for cultural heritage, cultural heritage institutions to, to ask themselves. Um, is it always the right thing for like a predominantly white institution to make these kinds of choices? Um, I don't know, I, I think so, yes, but yeah. So I have a question from the chat that I like to uh, share with you. Uh, this question comes from uh, J. Sylvia Cho. Uh, <laughs> thank you to all panelists for this thought-provoking presentation. Uh, question for Sarah. Your point about nurturing and mentoring is so important. Do you have any advice, comments on how to become a good nurturer, mentor based on your experience? Hi, Kalinda. Sylvia is a beautiful friend. She is a librarian at uh, the Graduate Center. So thank you so much, Sylvia, for the question and for being here. I, how do you become a good, I think that since I was nurtured, it was so natural uh, for me to just do it. And again, disruption goes in here. Y entrometida, y like a mama, you know, I'm so sorry, but that's the way I am with the students that come to us. And I, we see an interest in them and we see the potential. And, and then we begin um, giving them um, information about different, one thing that Dr. Uh, Professor, no, Don Idilio Gracia Peña, the chief archivist of the Institute, he has uh, created an, an internship program and is a different type of internship. And because what we do with the students, they come to us and we don't just teach them how to write these finding aids or the archival work, but also how to manage in an in an academic environment or in um, an, an employee, uh, if, if they become employees and all that. So we get like a family. And I know that some people are, don't like that, but that's the way we have been doing it at the Dominican Institute. We are a family. We care about each other, but at the same time, we respect each other. I think that's the key. And respecting if a person doesn't want to do this, okay, we let that go and we help the person to become whoever the person wants to become. But we have beautiful experiences at the Institute with the students. We can spend the whole day talking about them and where they are now and how they get connected, keep connect connection to us, et cetera. So Silvia, we can talk about this whenever you want. And <laughs> <laughs> any other questions from the chat? I don't see any coming through. I will ask one uh, that I got earlier on from one of our colleagues, um, curator at or bibliographer at the New York Public Library, Paloma Celis Carvajal. Um, she, she maintains and curates the collections that uh, for Latinx and Latin America and the Caribbean. So. Uh, she mentioned that it would be interesting for us to um, to talk about neutrality, you know, because curators are cannot be are not neutral. You know, curating collections is never a neutral uh, endeavor. So, what about and maybe this can go hand in hand uh, with uh, our discussion with uh, that had to do with disruption. <laughs> Should we be neutral? Uh, do can we be neutral? I'll let that, I'll leave that open for you to discuss. Yes, yeah. short, short answer. <laughs> no, I mean, because it, 
it's sort of like the myth of objectivity in academic research too, right? This idea that you can be a qualitative or a quantitative research and what's been valued in academia has been so be sort of like, but, but you must be objective, but yet everything from the research instrument to the topic that you decide is subjective. So collection development policies, subjective, right? Uh, <laughs> It, it, in its own it, in its own way, I'm choosing to uh, set the parameter that I'm going to develop a collection from this year to that year. That's someone who made a decision about that. That's not objective, <laughs> um, but not to make light of it either. I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I find it quite challenging whenever I encounter that language in any kind of discussion around research or cultural heritage. This idea of neutrality or objectivity. I, I don't believe it exists. I feel like what would be helpful is to just be more open about how subjective we are and owning up to how subjective we are. And then being like, but there's a place for this culture and there's a place for that culture. There's a place for this voice and that voice and making sense of that. And rather than focusing more on like whether something could be neutral, thinking about drawing the connections between the different stories that we encounter in our research collections, in our archival collections, and seeing where they can help uh, the knowledge creation. How can we foster the creativity? How can we foster the debates? And to be critical and to have healthy debates about things, even if we disagree, uh, to foster some more of that so that we could like get more knowledge created based along those lines, rather than walking around this myth that uh, somehow we have to maintain some level of neutrality or objectivity. Yeah, totally agree, Cynthia. And like choices are made constantly, right? At every level. And um, a really interesting example of this um, came up for me recently. I'm not involved in uh, like our, our digital collections program at the Dartmouth Library. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I, I pay attention and I'm curious about it. And recently um, I learned about um, a collection that has been, I think recently added that contains, uh, it's basically a 19th century comics collection <laughs> and contains a lot of problematic imagery, like deeply, deeply problematic from obviously today's standards, but I would say from like any time, right? Um, there's a lot of offensive imagery in there. And so, you know, they've, they've gone to, my colleagues have gone to um, lengths to contextualize the collection to kind of like, if you find it, you are first going to encounter, most likely, I think, um, at least if you come through the library, I don't know what happens if you come through a Google search, but um, you'll encounter a description and sort of a discussion about um, the choices made in uh, digitizing and making available this collection, but um, I don't know. I feel like I'm I'm really I struggle with it because right. I feel like you know why do we need to make that? Why is that the thing we decide to input our resources into? Like why do we put our labor and time and and money into making that available? When we know that the imagery is offensive, we know that it's harmful, right? And so on the one hand, I hear the argument like, well, this is just showing us who we really are as a culture, as a, you know, like what our, what our roots are, historical roots are, and, I, like, and how racist, you know, this country has been. And I think that's true. But I also think, you know, I don't know, I just, like on the other hand, you could look at it from a perspective of, you know, there's a value associated with having this available. And, and I'm just not sure it's the value we should like be behind. I don't know. So it's, it's, it's complicated, but um, here's Charlie. <laughs> um, but I think it gets at this neutrality thing. Like, can we even, no, you know, I just think, no, we can't like, you know, kind of approach this as like, uh, uh, from a neutrality perspective. 
Right. Be and curious I'm, of your thoughts on that. And, and I'm reading Paloma's clarification. Thank you for the clarification in the chat about your question. Yeah, like making the case that, yeah, how we all sort of struggle with it. It's some one way, and I don't know if this will answer your question, Paloma. If it doesn't, please feel free to chime in. One way we've tried to do this is we're uh, revitalizing our advisory board at the archives. And I feel that including community members and stakeholders in an advisory board is one way to approach this problem by getting much more diverse perspectives and outlooks in the involved in these decisions uh, might help to clarify that so that at least it's not just someone being put in a position to make this determination, speaking on behalf of the community. It's involving community members to be a part of that discussion and then thinking about co-creating those solutions together. And I feel that that's definitely one way to try to circumnavigate this dilemma that we, will, we all inherently, like what we in our time consider not a problem in two or three decades might be deemed problematic by other generations. We don't know, right? because uh, history and values and cultural values change over time, all the time. What people were able to get away with in the 60s and 70s and 80s, people are like totally holding people accountable. And then you've got this thing around cancel culture. So uh, it's hard to appease and to be right about this, right? Like what will history teach us in 10 years, right? Like thinking about these things. And I think that rather than, suffering in silence alone in our repositories. I feel like that's where the community engagement also helps. It's not just about us uh, listening to what the community has to say, but, but also listening to what the community can advise to us, right? So that it's not just us alone thinking about these issues and these dilemmas, but getting feedback from folks. And I think advisory boards or, or community groups or having those structures in place in repositories might help uh, shed light so that it's not just one perspective dominating these decisions if that if that makes any sense at all so, so cynthia would you, would some one of you either sara or cynthia read um paloma's um a question in the in the chat so that it's in the live streaming yeah it says here my question was more about how we can make our case with our administrators that neutrality doesn't exist in our collections that despite the inherited narrative of neutrality in our practices proof that there is no diverse representation in our collections or that our materials show only the Western hegemonic perspective. Basically what Jill was also echoing, I believe, but yeah. Paloma is um, a beautiful example of uh, the work that you are doing, Paloma, Celis Carvajal at the New York Public Library. Uh, you became and you began um, introducing more cultural um, relevant material to the New York Public Library and you're making sure that the collections that are there, that we that, that, that talk about the Latinx communities are, are known and people have access to them. So you are a great example of the work that you're doing. Keep doing it, please. We're here, we want to do it together. And one other thing, um, besides Cynthia's advice about the advisory board, that's a great one, Cynthia. Yes, and also the boards, any board. Well, another thing is that sometimes we think about politicians as ay, horrible, no? but not all of them, especially the politicians that are in the New York City Council. They can help a lot and they can bring resources. And with resources, then you can talk to the administration with grants. You can say, hey, I have this grant, I want to do this project. So it's easier that way. So that also think about that, about writing grants and getting monies outside of the institution that you can do all these projects. Right. And I mean, it's also sort of like inherent in the time because a few years ago, there weren't many grants that mm -hmm. funded this type of work. And now you even see the NEH getting involved with like more about like yes. projects that challenge the status quo. It's <laughs> becoming more in vogue now. Mm -hmm. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll start to see a, a tidal wave and just what foundations and other funding groups are, are wanting to fund. And then if you don't, you don't have to rely just on foundations, like you can also just reach out to the, your community and crowdfund as well, I feel like I'm, again, very much like hyper local is the thing, start a, 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 a some sort of like a, a Indiegogo campaign and you can basically get your friends in your community, a dollar can make a difference, right? If it's good for Wikipedia, it could be good for us too, right? 
<laughs> got in those little things from Jimmy Wales going, can you give Wikipedia a dollar to maintain the public knowledge base? I love that stuff. <laughs> so any more questions in the chat? I don't see any. I'm thinking uh, we have until uh, 6.15, but uh, we can end a little early. This is a difficult time of the day. People are commuting, people are going back to work, they're preparing dinner, and they're also getting ready, in this case, for our next event uh, of the day, day one of the conference, which I will share uh, with everyone in the uh, chat in a minute. So I don't know if there are any other thoughts, uh, closing thoughts maybe for this discussion that you would wanna share um with one another or any of the other um faces that i see here in the gallery who are part of CLAX, the center for latin american caribbean studies here at brown if anybody wants to uh, make a comment uh please do so um i will, we will welcome that i just want to um thank you again patricia and and just like give you know like all my love to Cynthia and Sara for the work you're doing it's really inspiring and and i just hope that you know people are are noticing and and supporting you and and all of us right um all of us library workers heritage workers in sort of taking this stance and and understanding that it's really vital to our campuses and into the larger communities, right? Beyond, as Cynthia has talked about. Um, and so I hope everybody attending kind of like feels that same pride and passion coming through and 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 does their part to to advocate. Also, doing this work takes time, and <laughs> time is complicated. A lot of time, a lot of resources. My love and admiration for. All of you, Sarah and Jill, I'm just so honored to have been part of this conversation. I appreciate you. Keep up the good fight. Palante, <laughs> <laughs> palante. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you so much. Um, we didn't talk about the word resistance when I, and resiliency. And I think that that's a very important uh, way of looking at this as well. Así que muchísimas gracias, uh, Patricia, Patricia, bella hermosa, uh, for organizing this because it can, you have a lot to say. You also can be one of the panelists. And we appreciate that you gave us your, the opportunity. And Jill and Cynthia, las quiero un montón. Gracias. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, Patsy Lewis is saying thank you also. Patsy, I don't know if you want to say anything, uh, or even Kate as well. I, share the information on uh, the next event, which is going to be a perform live performing event, well, uh, via Zoom, obviously. Uh, so I don't know if you want to share information or any other uh, closing thoughts. I just put the link to the event in the chat. So please feel free to check it out. Uh, and it will start in about an hour. Excellent. And Kate, can you say if there's another way to access it for people who may not? Well, outside of the chat, just to remind us. Sure. So uh, the next uh, event uh, is going to take place at seven o'clock from seven to eight thirty. It's a performance um, event. It's Frontera um, Bugalú, uh, Danger AK, and Laura Guevara, hosted by Eduardo Pinillos and Raúl. Castañato of Peru's Marte, uh, Martes de Salsa. And it's going to be moderated by Richard Snyder, professor of political science here at Brown University. And the link is right here in the chat, which uh, I'm, I'm not going to read to you because it won't make any sense. So um, hopefully you can join the last event of the day. And tomorrow um, is the second day of the conference. So I hope others can join as well. Okay, I think this is uh, the last. Um, the end of the, the, the panel, <laughs> the round table. Thank you very much. For... Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.